Latanya Head's story was one of the most tragic to come out of 9-11. She worked at Merrill Lynch, and at the time of the attack, she was helping to close a merger. She was one of only 19 survivors who were on or above the point of impact. When the North Tower was hit by the first plane at 846, she was on the 96th floor of the South Tower. From her office in the South Tower, she could see bodies falling. Her fiance Dave was in the North Tower and she tried to call him, but the call wouldn't go through. When the second plane hit, she was in the sky lobby waiting for an express elevator on the 78th floor. And she saw the plane coming towards them and then she heard a loud crash. She felt the building shake and she felt the intense heat from the fire. She also remembers the smell of her skin burning and how her arm was almost completely severed. She went flying through the air, she hit a wall, and she was knocked unconscious. And when she stood up, she noticed that her secretary's head was gone. Tanya was led to safety by Wells Crowther. He was known as the man in the red bandana. And with that bandana, he extinguished the flames on her clothes. He was also a volunteer firefighter and an equities trader. And his father gave him a red bandana when he was six. And from that day on, he always carried a red bandana with him. He saved 12 people that day by leading them to the only stairs that weren't destroyed. He went up the stairs to help others come down. He carried a woman on his shoulders and he led others to the stairs, bringing them down to the floor and then outside. After making sure they were safe, he went back in to help even more people and he lost his life while saving others. His father later found an FDNY application in his apartment that was dated a few weeks before 9-11. Wells never handed the application in, but he did fill it out. And his father, Jeff, handed it in to see if his son would have been hired. And the FDNY got back to him quickly. And they said he would have, without a doubt, been accepted. As Tanya was crawling through the rubble, she met a man that was close to dying. And he handed her his wedding ring and asked for it to be returned to his wife. And six days later, Tanya woke up in a hospital burn unit and she found out that her fiance Dave had been killed in the North Tower. A few years later, she donated her wedding dress to charity. In 2004, she traveled to Thailand after the tsunami and then to Louisiana to help after Hurricane Katrina in 2005. On top of all of that, in 2004, she also joined the World Trade Center Survivors Network after one of the founders learned about her. She had started an online support group for 9-11 survivors via Yahoo message boards. And in 2005, she became the face of the September 11th survivors movement by telling her story to the media and to tour groups at Ground Zero. And she was even chosen to guide then Mayor Bloomberg as well as Rudy Giuliani on a tour during the inauguration of the World Trade Center Tribute Center. There was just one problem. None of her story was true. In 2007, the New York Times started to investigate Tanya and they told the world that her story was nothing more than a massive lie. When the planes hit, Tanya wasn't in New York. She wasn't even in the country. She wasn't even on this continent. She was in graduate school in Barcelona, Spain. No part of her story was verified beforehand, but you don't really expect people to lie about something as serious as 9-11. But now I know that it is not uncommon for people to do. Another lie that she liked to tell was that she had an undergrad degree from Harvard and an MBA from Stanford, but neither school had a record of her. A board member of the Survivors Network said Tanya told her that she had been in the building applying for an internship, but she told others that she worked for Merrill Lynch. Merrill Lynch had no record of employing her. They didn't even have offices in either building at the time. And that badly burned arm? She told a colleague that happened in a car crash. Her arm was severed and it flew out of the car, but they found it and it was able to be reattached. That part is true. Sometimes she would call Dave her husband, Sometimes she'd call him her fiance. She said that they finished each other's sentences and they were perfect for each other. And they supposedly met when he stole her cap in front of the World Trade Center. Sounds like a movie to me. 
Dave did die of the attacks. It was verified, but he and Tanya had never met. None of his friends or family had ever heard of Tanya. She didn't even have pictures of him to show her friends, and there weren't even any pictures of the two of them together. Dave's identity is protected, so his last name is usually never given in reference to Tanya. But it's not hard to find his name, but out of respect, I'll leave it out of the video. She told several people that her wedding was planned for October of 2001 and that they lived together with their golden retriever named Elvis. No one ever saw Elvis when they visited her. She would always tell them that he was being walked, but I don't think he even existed. In 2007, the New York Times wanted to interview her about her experiences on 9-11, but she canceled three interviews and she refused to provide any details to verify any parts of her story. And she was really freaking out at this point. She was having anxiety attacks. She would cry. She would shake. And she would call other members in the survivors group and tell them how she was being harassed by reporters and the New York Times. But I guess she realized that the jig was almost up. Oh, and her name wasn't even Tanya. It's Alicia Esteve Head. But in order to avoid confusion, I'll just call her Tanya throughout the video. She was born on July 31st, 1973 in Barcelona, Spain. She came from a very wealthy family that was involved in a 1992 financial scandal in which her father and her brother had to serve prison time. She was the youngest child and she was the only girl. They had three homes and their life was filled with yachting, horses, and tennis clubs. She was considered spoiled and every wish was granted no matter how extravagant it was. One summer, while on vacation, her parents flew in her three horses from Barcelona because she whined that she missed them. For her 16th birthday, she got a diamond-encrusted Rolex that was worth tens of thousands of dollars. But what she really wanted was to be an American. She idolized Americans, and one of her close childhood friends said that she was always talking about the United States. The World Trade Center Survivors Network was created so that survivors could help each other through the disaster and support each other. Before the group was created, most of the public support was paid to victims, their families, and first responders. But the group also wanted to offer support to civilians that were at the World Trade Center that day, as well as personnel and volunteers that were involved in the rescue and recovery efforts. I remember reading about a postal worker. She was there to deliver mail and she saw bodies falling. So she needed support too. She wasn't actually inside of the building, but she was still there that day and she saw some horrible things. But people like her were not getting any type of support. 9-11 survivors weren't even allowed private access to Ground Zero as family members were. If they wanted to visit the site, they had to wait in line with the tourists. It was like they were forgotten about. Their pain wasn't acknowledged. But Tanya's incredible story helped the group get more of the attention that they needed and deserved. And she also launched a campaign to save the staircase that carried so many to safety. Tanya was basically a representative of 20,000 9-11 survivors. She talked a lot about how the survivors of the collapse had been overlooked by the media. And it was something that a lot of survivors talked about. She eventually became president of the Survivors Network through manipulation. She manipulated members of the support group to go against the co-founder, Jerry, and to have him removed. She had them thinking that Jerry was bad for the group. So she wanted to be the leader and she got her wish. She was voted in as president when he left. That title didn't exist previously. They didn't have officers or titles. Everyone was equal. Her friends said that Tanya was very smart and very competitive and she would surround herself with people that she didn't think could compete with her. So when it came to 9-11, her story needed to be the best and get the most attention. Her story had to be the most powerful, the most tragic. There seems to be a hierarchy of suffering. The irony of this hierarchy was that at the top was a fraud. Some survivor stories were more valued than others. Some didn't make much of an impact and the media gave the most attention to the most morbid and tragic of survivor stories. It was the survivor's network that ultimately led to Tanya's exposure as a fraud. When the New York Times was looking for someone to interview for its sixth anniversary of 9-11, the 
Several members recommended Tanya, but the Times did a background check for the article and that's when things started to look sketchy. If it hadn't been for the Times, I don't know if her lies would have ever been exposed. Today, some survivors say that a great deal of their healing came from Tanya helping them and helping survivors be recognized. She was also an inspiration for survivors. If she could keep going after what she had been through, so could they. And she gave them hope and so many people admired her for that. She seemed so strong and she helped them in ways that no one else could. And today there are some that forgive her and some that don't. A lot of people think that she had something going on mentally that caused her to act that way. And Wells Crowther's mother is one of those people. After every disaster, a small number of people pretend to be victims. Usually it's about money, but that's not always the case. People will try to get benefits they aren't entitled to. Employees will say they've lost their jobs and they hadn't, or people will say they've lost their spouse and their spouse is still alive. There was a young mother of two that told police two days after the attacks that her husband was a police officer and that he was trapped in the pile. He had just called her on his cell phone. So a police officer rushed her down to ground zero and rescue workers searched for him in this unstable pile of rubble. Then she disappeared. Four months later, she pleaded guilty to reckless endangerment and she was sentenced to three years in prison. There's a documentary that you should watch if you're interested in this. It's called The Woman Who Wasn't There and there's interviews with her and other members of the Survivors Network. And the interviews take place before and after her lives were brought to light. And once she was exposed, she declined all further interviews and she quickly left New York. In February of 2008, an anonymous email was sent from a Spanish account to members of the Survivors Network. And it claimed that Tanya had taken her own life. But that wasn't true because she was seen with her mother in New York on September the 14th, 2011. In July of 2012, she was fired from her job at an insurance company in Barcelona once her employers found out about her stunt in New York. Fortunately, she never made any money from her lies and she actually donated a great deal of money to the group. And she felt betrayed by her friends and the survivors group who spoke to reporters about the pain that she had caused to them. And she has shown no remorse. You can watch the documentary on Tubi for free. Just create an account and you can watch it on there. You can watch all kinds of movies. There's a website and an app.